Well, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here and uh, giving me some of your time. So hopefully uh, you find this interesting. Um, it's something that I've wondered a lot about. Um, I repaired my first predictor probably six years ago and numerous ones since. I've, I keep hearing the rumor that, oh yeah, that Philco was great and then they came out with this one bum set and it ruined everything and killed them. And that really kind of bothered me that it's like, okay, how can one product kill an entire company? So I wanted to research this a bit and kind of maybe put this to bed finally. Um, you know, Philco had a lot of problems way before the Predict even came out. So we're gonna kind of take a little look at the history of the company, what transpired not only in the company, but in the economy, the markets that they were selling into everything kind of came together at the wrong time and that's really what was their demise so so like i said the typical line you see the focal predictive television line was a marketing success and a technological failure it had design flaws i'm not going to argue that it wasn't the best design but you know it did what it had to do so i guess we're going to break this up into three parts we're going to look at what Philco was and became prior to World War II. World War II was kind of a turning point for the company. And after World War II, how did they evolve? How did they change? And then finally, um, you know, when they finally reached the point where they needed a safety net and Ford said, okay, we'll, we'll acquire you. So, um, I drew information for this presentation from many different sources. Um, the primary source, there was uh, PhD management thesis paper out of MIT in the early 80s and I want to thank Bob Anderson for finding this and he sent it to me he says this might be helpful I said dude this is a gold mine of information <laughs> um, he did a lot of the legwork on it but there's also various um, where's the button here employee newsletters annual reports the Hagley Museum in Delaware has a large digitized uh, part of their collection and they have a lot of old business documents from Philco Corporation. The Henry Ford Museum also has them in their Benson Ford Research Center but their stuff isn't digitized and with the pandemic still kind of going on they're not allowing outside people in to look through the archives unfortunately. Um, there's a lot of online sources as well. Um, PhilcoRadio.com was one. Um, Wikipedia even had a few little things here and there so so looking at the history of Philco up to World War II, originally the company was founded by Thomas Spencer in 1892 and his original goal was to make arc lamps. So then they became the Helios Electric Company. They put a new headquarters in Philadelphia around 1895. 1906 they became known as the Philadelphia Storage Battery Company. That's the early name a lot of people associate with them. Uh, that was a good thing because the automobile self-starter came about not long afterwards and that opened a huge market for them. So uh, only six years later they reached their first $1 million in sales year, which was pretty good. Um, 1919 began their legendary marketing campaigns. I mean, Philco would blitz any media with all kinds of advertising, whether it be billboards, whether it be newspapers, magazines, whatever. They did everything they could to get their name out in front of as many people as possible. And that continued on. I think at one point in the late 50s, they had spent over 100 million in advertising cumulatively from 1919 on. So that's quite a bit. Um, 1922, they started diversifying into batteries for radio. And then 1927, they finally entered into the radio market. Now, the time frame in which they did this was kind of pivotal in the radio industry because the market was maturing. Up to that point, there had been 115 manufacturers, 161 newcomers into the radio market, and 261 of those companies either exited the business or failed. By 1928, there was only 70 radio manufacturers. 16 newcomers, 18 failures. So when the market's mature, that's kind of a odd time to get involved with it, but Philco was very careful. They came out with the Model 511 and they just wanted to test the market. One model, 
they purchased all the parts from outside and assembled it. They did the, the engineering and assembly, but they didn't make any of the components. So that way, <laughs> if it flopped, they weren't out a lot of money. So Jim Skinner, the president, as he was quoted as saying, in 1928, our job was to walk before we ran, make a good set, and establish a reputation for quality. So it was well received by the market. 1929, they started doing mass production of radios of various designs. Um, of course, the Depression was right on the heels of this time frame, so they were very careful to not overproduce. They only wanted to make as many radios as people were able to buy at the time, so they didn't have a lot of excess inventory. Um, 1930 is when the competition really started heating up with RCA. Uh, RCA came out with what they called midget radio sets because by, most, or by that time, most people had already had a radio in the home, a large cabinet radio, and about 60% of sales were for replacement of old units that people wanted to change out. So to keep people buying radios, they started doing like the All-American 5 type little table radios and that. Uh, Philco responded with the Transitone radio line. That was their midget set entry into the market. So in 1938 is one key year because that's when Philco started to diversify beyond radios. Radio manufacturers at the time were getting into selling refrigerators. And that might seem kind of an odd combination, but it actually made sense if you look at the business of the markets of those. Radios tended to sell well between September and January, with your sales peaking right before Christmas. Whereas refrigerators and then related equipment did well in the spring and summer months. So that kind of balanced out the, the sales in that. Nice thing too is the refrigerators could be sold through the same channels of distribution. They didn't have to create a whole new distribution network in order to provide this product. So to that end, in June, they struck an agreement with York Ice Machine Company to do Philco branded refrigeration products. Uh, November, they outright purchased Fairbanks Morse's um, refrigeration division. So their advertising became Philco all year round. And that's an example of a dealer display with the little flags being all the different types of products that they sold throughout the year. So coming into 1940, uh, Forbes had a very high opinion of Philco's management and the way the company was run. Uh, the, their tenets were give the public new value for the money, use up-to-date manufacturing processes, and try to operate with a low profit margin. And they were very successful with that. They wanted the executives to come up through the ranks. They kind of cultivated them to what they referred to as the Philco style of management. So all the high up executives were on the same page with where the company was headed, what its goals were, what markets it wanted to get into. Um, another thing too, Philco was still a private company. So the executives were paid as dividends from sales. So everyone worked towards a common goal to have good sales figures. Management knew each other well. They could make quick decisions. It worked very well for the company. Uh, the author of the PhD paper made a nice uh, observation here. Philco's management had a clear idea of where the firm was headed. Product, marketing, and sales policies evolved logically. Constant vigilance was kept over all areas of the business. Never was an area of Philco allowed to run wild. And this is important for what's going to happen after the war because they took that and totally threw it out the window. So I'm trying to set the stage for what's coming. 1940 was kind of a pivotal year. Uh, Philco had operated under a two-company structure. There was Philadelphia Storage Battery and Philco Radio Corporation. Why this was done was RCA licensed their patents and technology to other companies, and it was based, or the royalty was computed based on the sale of the <coughs> unit that contained their technology. So to sidestep this, Philco had the Philadelphia Storage Battery Company build the chassis, which used the RCA patents. Then they sold the chassis to Philco Radio Company for the cabinets and final assembly and that, thus sidestepping some of the RCA royalties. 
It worked very well until RCA got wind of what they were doing. And they came back and threatened Philco that if you don't pay us our back royalties, we're going to cancel our agreements. Well, Philco said, mm, you're not doing that. They took them to court over it after a lengthy legal struggle. Um, the Supreme Court of Delaware finally handed down a ruling in Philco's favor that RCA had to basically let them use what they were doing for the price that they were paying. So with that being set in stone legally, that allowed them to consolidate into the Philco Corporation. They didn't have two shell companies feeding each other because they all had the same addresses, same buildings, everything. It was just more, again, to get around RCA. You'll find that there was not much love lost between Philco and RCA over the years. They were bitter enemies. It seemed like they were always in court over something, um, each one trying to get the upper hand. But Philco noted that we're still focused on radios and refrigeration. That's going to be our core business. We're not really going to deviate too much from that. Uh, to further kind of stick it to RCA, they bought a controlling interest in National Union Tubes, so they didn't have to buy tubes from RCA. Um, and then the last big thing was 1940 was the year that Philco went public on the stock exchange. So now you're answering to shareholders, which can have its good and bad points. Um, he, I think I did see a footnote about that around the same time as Workin was working with RCA. Um, I don't know the exact time frame, but yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Okay, well that would make sense too. So, so now we get into World War II, and you know Philco, like many other companies, the government was putting out bids for doing radios, any kind of equipment that was going to be needed for national defense. And Philco really wanted to get into radar, and they saw this as the perfect opportunity to do it, but. The government looked at Philco and said, you guys, you guys build radios. We'll give you radio contracts, but no, you guys don't do radar. We're not, we're not going to bother with you. Well, the government had a very aggressive timeline for the radar systems they wanted developed, and you know, all the other major companies that provided that technology pushed back and said, no way, there's no way in hell we're going to be able to, to do this that fast. So Philco said, no, we'll be able to do it in your time frame. So the government was reluctant about it, but they gave Philco a chance. Philco worked day and night and actually delivered the product ahead of schedule, which totally delighted the government. And the government basically said, any jobs you want, they're yours. So Philco grabbed as much business as it could during the war and really did well. Um, I think they ended up doubling their sales over the course of the the four years that the war went on. And uh, one other key thing to note, Philco was very careful to keep their distribution network intact. There was a lot of limitations on consumer goods during the war because stuff was needed for the war effort. So they found whatever they could that wasn't being regulated for production. So sometimes Philco dealers were selling paint, sometimes they were selling rugs, whatever they could just to try and keep their uh, dealers afloat. So, as I mentioned, the war doubled Philco sales, but it also introduced them to the area of research. And that's something that became very alluring to them over the following years. So now, moving into the post-war years, they were thinking, okay, 1946, civilian production can resume. There's this pent-up demand. Everyone's going to want to be buying stuff. 46 is going to be a great year. Eh, not quite. There were still a lot of issues with supply chains during the war. There was material shortages. Um, there were some strikes at some of the plants uh, that slowed things down. So things didn't start as rosy as they were expecting. But however, they did expect to have the demand come. So Philco started a major expansion program. They built a new plant in Pennsylvania. The old Atwater Kent facility, which is here. In fact, there's actually a, this picture actually has the for sale sign out in front of it. Philco bought that, so they basically had a turnkey factory. And they purchased the Lansdale Tube Company. 
And since they now wholly owned a tube company, they sold off their interest in National Union. By 1947, they had 16 manufacturing plants. Within a year, they gained three more, up to 20. 47 was the first year that refrigerator sales actually surpassed radio sales. 48 was the entry into television. They were a little later than some of the other companies, but that's something to note. And in a rare move of divestiture, Philco sold off the storage battery division. Normally, it seemed like they were acquiring stuff left and right, but they did sell a couple things off. Um, but speaking of acquisitions, they got the Rex Manufacturing uh, Company, they did refrigerators, and then there was Electromaster, they were starting to get into electric ranges, so getting into what they call the white goods market or home appliances. That started to expand. So 49, added another three manufacturing plants to what they already had. And the key thing that happened here was Philco changed its management structure. They went to what's called a decentralized management structure. So rather than corporate calling all the shots for all the divisions, each division was allowed to operate like its own semi-autonomous company. So you know, the upper management held all the purse strings, had legal, things like that, whereas the divisions had their own R&D, marketing, et cetera. So this was seen as a good way to concentrate on what each division was focused on. And on paper, it's good, because the decision making has moved lower in the organization, they can respond faster to the market. However, this also duplicates a lot of effort amongst the, the different divisions, which costs money. Was Philco big enough to support that? Because it was very successful. I mean, what are a couple other companies you can think of that operated that way? General Motors. Bingo, General Motors and DuPont. And they were big powerhouses in those times. But they were much bigger companies. They could afford it. So another good observation here, if proper control is not exercised from the top, short-term gains may be substituted for long-term goals, putting divisional welfare ahead of the corporation. This is referring back to that whole not letting them run wild. Here's where the reins were starting to be loosened. So under the new divisional structure, corporate took care of the administration, the advanced research legal, divisions took care of their management, long-range planning, research, engineering, sales, bookkeeping. So out of all these divisions, there was television and radio, refrigerator, government and industrial, electric range, broadcasting, accessories, distribution, and international markets. So moving into 1950, the recession of 1949, they started to see a rebound from that. For profits, that ended up being Philco's best year ever up to that point. And as their existence as a standalone company, that was the best year of their corporate history. Their plant floor space had tripled by now since 1940. Uh, they started investing a lot more into research and development. Um, they saw themselves as being able to rival RCA. They wanted to create a patent estate that they could market and sell their technology to other companies and have them come to them rather than having everyone come to RCA. So that's a somewhat recent picture of one of their R&D buildings in Philadelphia. And here's where I'm gonna start noting a couple key economic indicators here. I didn't wanna bog down on too much financial data, but it's important to start to see how things started trending downward from this point. So they had 56% more sales in 1950. Their pre-tax profits were up 172%, which is very good. Pre-tax earnings as a percentage of sales was at 10%. And this is one of the key indicators because you'll start seeing this drop and fluctuate wildly over the course of the decade. So 51, we had the Korean War looming. Um, Philco spent about 10% of its money on gearing up for anticipated government work, like what they saw from World War II. Um, they put 8.7 million into the Lansdale plant, expecting to make a significant increase in tube production, because they figured we're gonna need tubes for government contracts, but we don't wanna cut into civilian production. 
demand ought to be high after the war, so all that will go to civilian. They felt there was a need that justified it. So this was also the year they started getting into transistor research. Philco saw it was going to be the wave of the future, but they didn't want to pay patents to Bell Labs. So they said, we can find a better way to do this and get around it. 51, because of the uneasiness about Korea, they experienced a 9% drop in sales. Their pre-tax profits fell 35%. Pre-tax earnings as a percentage of sale fell down to 72 <coughs> So, 52, completion of yet another TV plant, uh, which gave them a 50% increase in capacity and gave them the highest production capacity for televisions in the entire industry. They built a compressor plant for refrigerators in Indiana, and that will come into play later on once they realize that they had overexpanded. They kept increasing R&D. They had up to almost 2,000 R&D staff by then. And in keeping with the famous advertising things that Philco would do, this was the year that Philco sponsored major national broadcasts. They covered everything in the election, both the Republican and Democratic conventions, the election returns, all that stuff. And that's an old ad from that. Sales went up 20%. Their, although their pre-tax profits only went up 16%, and yet, despite that, their earnings still fell to just under 7%. So even though they were selling more stuff, they had less money to work with. Consumer goods markets were strong in 1953 for the first three quarters, but then they hit a dip at the end, which didn't do well for Philco. Uh, the whole industry had an overstock of goods, so they had to pare that down. So what do you do? You reduce price to, to move product. Seven and a half million spent on refrigerator and television plants. 17% increase in sales, which by sales numbers was the best year for Philco. However, when you look at their balance sheet, there was an $8 million sale of WPTZ to Westinghouse. So if you take that $8 million out of the equation, <coughs> Their profits only rose 6%. And again, their earnings as a percentage of sales fell even further to 6.3. But 1953, there was a new R&D discovery that they were hoping was gonna be a big home run and boost the company, the surface barrier transistor. It was the first high frequency transistor. It operated at around 60 megahertz, which made it very attractive for computer-based technology because um, it had a fast enough switching speed. It also got Philco interested in making computers. Their first computers they offered were mainly for defense, usually like for missile guidance systems, uh, small computer applications like that. 1954, consumer markets were still weak. The markets finally did stabilize. Philco had a lot of overcapacity. They had built too many plants to make too many products that just weren't selling. So if you were in charge of a business, what would your move be if you were faced with that situation? Whatever you do, don't build more plants. Right. So what did Philco do? We spent five and a half million on, exp on facilities expansion. <laughs> Mainly at Lansdale, because they wanted to make transistors there. Um, some other things that happened, they had a 45-day strike at uh, the Sandusky, Ohio auto radio plant and the Philadelphia television plant. They won a 3.5% or 3 wage increase. Yeah. They were really starting to focus on color TV research, and Philco really had placed their bets on a one-gun system. Again, RCA was three-gun. We don't want to deal with RCA. We'll you know, the heck with them, we're gonna do our own thing. And it wasn't until, I think it was Sony in the late 60s finally got a one gun color CRT to work. Philco poured a ton of time and money into it and it was never successful. This was also the year they started sponsoring the Miss America pageant and had the accompanying line of Miss America televisions to augment that. Sales dropped 19%, like we said, it was a weak market. Their profits fell 61%. Jeez. 
and they were now down to 3% of earnings from sales. So it's, it's getting worse. 55, the economy started to rebound. However, there was a lot of competition in the market, which didn't allow prices to rise. Another brief slowdown in 55, cut into the fourth quarter profits, which hurt them overall for the year. Once again, 4.7 million spent on facilities, <laughs> uh, mainly again for transistors. So, you know, if we add this up, we're looking at 10 to 15 million they dumped into transistor production alone, not even the research part of it in these few years. And just as they geared up everything to start making a lot of these transistors, Bell Labs comes out and says, we've developed the Mesa transistor platform. Surface barrier technology will be obsolete. So Philco geared up, bet big on this new transistor technology that now no one was going to want. Yeah, <laughs> face palm. Uh, with the stronger economy, sales did go up a bit. Their profits had a slight bump. They got the pre-tax earnings as a percentage of sales up to 4.6%. But Fortune Magazine made a very good observation of the situation. Decisions like Philco's are daring in the extreme because the semiconductor art is so new and fluid. Anytime a better product may sweep the market. They saw the writing on the wall that this was a dangerous bet that they were placing. And it bit them. So 56. TV market was starting to become saturated, so the focus became more on small portable sets. Again, like radios, everyone had a big cabinet TV in their house. People didn't need two of them. And GE aggravated the issue by coming out with a portable for less than $100. So everyone hated GE for doing that that year. Uh, the TV market was starting to consolidate in response to this market saturation. By 1954, there was 101 TV manufacturers, only 50 remaining three years later in 1957. Appliance markets were also weak at this time, but let's buy Sierra Electronics and Bendix Appliances. <laughs> Another 6.7 million spent on facilities and expansion of existing buildings and that. Management finally realizes that <laughs> This decentralized organizational structure is out of control. They need to step in and rein the divisional people in. So 1956, they started a restructuring plan. So sales went down 7%. Pre-tax profits fell 97%. Pre-tax earnings as a percentage of sales was down to a dismal 0.16%. One, they're barely breaking even. <laughs> so what led to this haphazard post-war expansion? It was too fast. The demand just wasn't justifying what they were investing into their facilities and production, thus giving them high operating leverage. You gotta pay for all those plants, you gotta pay taxes, you gotta pay upkeep, everything. All that cost is gonna be there every year. So if your sales don't make up for that, you're out of money. Rising labor costs, yet retail prices were falling. As I mentioned, they poured a ton of money into transistors, color television. They started building their computer division at this time. The banks were starting to get restless because they had borrowed a lot of money and they're worried is Philco gonna be able to pay it back? Um, so, you know, could... Yeah. Well, yeah, but hindsight's 2020. Okay. <laughs> Nobody had a crystal ball to see that, unfortunately. Um, you know, they were trying to get concessions from labor. They were slow to keep up with the latest production processes. Before the war, they prided themselves in the latest and greatest production techniques. They'd fallen away from that, and now it was coming back to bite them. So 57. Markets improved a little bit, although they had another dip in the fourth quarter, which was leading into the recession of 1958. They only spent $1 million that year on facilities. Uh, that was their Palo Alto Western Research Facility, as seen in the annual report. 
Sales did go up a little bit. Profits jumped 755 percent. I'm not sure why there was such a big swing there. Um, I don't have a business background, so <laughs> someone might be able to explain that to me. Uh, they got the earnings back up to 1.86 percent of sales, but that was still pretty bad compared to other competitors. So when they wanted to restructure, the uh, first thing they did was cut their inventory by about 20 percent. Inventory is considered a liability in business because you've put money into this product, but until you sell it, you're not recouping that money. They paid 18 million back to the banks to eliminate the short-term debt and calm the banks down. And the materials buying was back to being tailored to use. After the war, whenever they could get material, they bought large quantities of it because they didn't know if they'd be able to get it the next month or next year with the supply shortages. But unfortunately, Philco never really got away from that. So they realized, no, we got to go back to buying only what we need for the quarter or however uh, many months they spaced that out. They had overextended the TV production, so they consolidated that. Um, we mentioned the compressor plant in Indiana. They ended up selling that because they discovered it was cheaper to buy compressors from the outside than to make them in-house. Uh, they opened up a central warehouse to try and reduce some of the costs around paperwork, transportation. And four new bar board members were brought in from outside the company to diversify management. That's a complete 180 from what they were doing before the war where they wanted everyone to come up through the ranks and through the Philco system. They retained Arthur D. Little uh, management consultants to help them come up with a new corporate structure that would work well for their size and what their business needs were. Arthur D. Little is still in business today doing management consulting, which is kind of interesting. So 58, they came out with the Transac S2000 computer and they marketed the heck out of that because they beat IBM to the market by one year with a transistor computer. Also 58 was the introduction of the Predicta. So you see all, this, all these storm clouds brewing beforehand, just now is when the Predicta is coming on the scene. And it sold very well at first, however, the sales kind of dropped off, the novelty kind of wore off. Some people thought the styling was even too radical for some of the modern style that was in vogue at the time. They started to put the new organizational framework into place. Sales dipped. Of course, it's recession year. Pre-tax profits were down 16%, and the earnings as a percentage of sales was still hanging around 1.5%. Didn't move that much. So to restructure, they abolished the eight divisions that made up the old company. So the new divisional uh, structure, they just had consumer products and industrial products. So consumer took care of the uh, consumer electronics, the appliances, the marketing of such products. Um, they found that the company was weak in long range planning. Again, what we said before, today's sale versus tomorrow's goals. So the VP of marketing was assigned to a long-range profit policy responsibility. Funds to the divisions were now allocated based on need. Before, it was whatever division brought in the most money, they got the biggest budget for the following year. So large divisions, they got bigger. The small ones couldn't grow because they just didn't have the resource. Um, Arthur D. Little studies were commissioned for further reductions in cost. For 1959, they were gonna look at consolidating more manufacturing facilities. And in 1960, how could they revamp their distribution and dealer networks to try and save money? And as one of the Arthur D. Little consultants had noted, management was always putting off tomorrow's plans for today's sale. So they had no idea where they wanted to go. So 59, the economy was starting to improve from the recession. Structure at first looked like it was potentially working because sales went up 13%. Pre-tax profits went up 168% over the previous year. And they actually boosted the percentage uh, of sales up to almost 4%. So there was some improvement. However, in 1960, it was short-lived. Um, they dropped 14.3 million into a con uh, computer production facility out in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. <coughs> 
Transistor radios were now 50% of Philco's radio business, and they were starting to get a lot of competition from Asia. So there was price competition there. You can see the two ads. The Toshiba 7 transistor radio was selling for $59. Comparable 7 transistor Philco was selling for $39. There was just an industry-wide decline in sales of both consumer electronics and appliances. Again, sales dips, not good. Philco sales only went up 0.7% from 1959 into 1960. Profits down 85%. Pre-tax earnings as a percentage of sales down to just over half a percent. So 1961, the chickens come home to roost. It was obvious that the restructuring was too little too late. They didn't have the finances to really fully execute all the changes that were required to go into their new corporate structure. So that's when they started talking with Ford about a potential sale. Oh yeah. Yep, in the Plymouth and a few other, uh, yeah, a couple other companies. Sales were stagnant. First and second quarter, they had combined losses of four, almost four and a half million dollars. They're bleeding money by now. So Ford arranged a, an exchange of common stock to do the sale. Ford mainly had their eye on the aerospace division. They wanted to get into that market. The space race is starting to heat up, and they saw Philco as a bargain entry into that market. So that was their primary reason for their interest in Philco. A side benefit was General Motors had Frigidaire appliances. Now they've got their own appliance division to compete with them. So this is an old Philco Ford um, refrigerator ad. And they viewed Philco overall as a sound company. It just had serious management problems. So after Ford, what happened to everything? Well, 1967, Philco Ford recorded sales approaching almost a billion dollars. So they became rather successful in that regard. They realized that there's no way they were gonna be able to compete with IBM in the computer market, so very quickly they got out of the computer market in 63. And subsequently they got out of semiconductors a year later. They sold Lansdale Semiconductor to Edward Pincus, who also had bought some of Motorola's old semiconductor technology. He formed Lansdale Electronics, or no, Lansdale Semiconductor out in California, which I believe is still in business. Yes, they sell. Okay, yep. Okay. If some company needs something that was made, you know, usually military, if you need something that was made you know, 10 years ago and hasn't been made, you can get it from them. Okay. Well, yeah. But it's worth it. Not you can get anything for a price. And re-qualify. <laughs> re-qualify costs up more than the redesign you did. Wow. It's improved to the military. It's just as good. Yep. You can buy the same parts. You have to do that. Yeah. No, it's interesting to know. Uh, they got out of the consumer electronics in 1974 because there was more and more competition from Asia and they felt it was time to get out. So uh, they sold the Philco appliance or consumer electronics division and the name to GTE Sylvania later in 1981. They sold all that to North American Philips, which I believe still technically owns the name, even though it's not really put on any uh, product. White Consolidated purchased the appliance division in 1977. Frigidaire followed suit two years later. <clears throat> Philco Aerospace, uh, one of their big achievements was they designed and built the equipment for the Mission Operations Control Room in Houston. So all the famous consoles you see the flight controllers sitting at, Philco Aerospace built all those. And Aerospace was finally sold to the Laurel Corporation in 1990. So that's where everything got scattered to afterwards. So a little what if question. You know, we talked about diversification as potentially being one of the issues that Philco was dealing with. And it did make sense to a point. When they started getting into computers and other things, those did not have the same distribution channels that consumer goods did. So they kind of got into trouble there. But out of all the radio manufacturers that were getting into selling refrigerators and stuff like we mentioned at the beginning, 
Zenith chose not to do that. Zenith chose to stay focused solely on consumer electronics or radionics as they called it. So they stuck with that through the 70s and had pretty good success. And I know this is a bit of an eye chart based on the size of the room, but you know, we talked about that earnings as a percentage of sales. Zenith basically stayed between 9 and 13% year over year. Their sales were very consistent, whereas Philco's were up big one year, way down the next, and they were all over the place, but shrinking overall. So it's kind of a neat little what if question to ponder. So to wrap this up, you know, Philco began as a very focused and disciplined company. They were very careful with how they spent money, how they entered into new markets. But World War II, they started to see, oh, research, this looks kind of cool. Hey, we can, we, can, we can go up against RCA. Uh, the market conditions sort of clouded the reality of the situation. And by then, they'd already started kind of marching towards um, a disastrous direction. As I mentioned, they diversified into markets that were vastly different from consumer goods. So they kind of had to invent the wheel there. Decentralized management was just not suitable for a company like Philco. And getting back, tying this back to the whole thing about the Predicta, yeah, warranty issues do cost money, but they were just one of the many, many straws that broke Philco's back. So that's where I wanted to go with this. So um, I thank you for your attention. I tried not to get this too dry in financials and that, but it's, it's important to paint the picture of what was going on. So uh, thank you again, and uh, <laughs> turn it over to Bob. <laughs>